Thank you, Father. Those that are watching, those here in this building, those that are keep continue to come, we do thank you that you are healing cancer. We do thank you that you are healing the mind, the broken hearts. We thank you today that you're showing your power and your love with such purity. It's as if we're the only person in the room and we're the only one that you see. Now, Lord, do your work. Do your work. Like a breeze from heaven, let it come across every heart, every life. Make this a moment that we'll remember for eternity. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. How many feel the presence of God? You feel? Witness? Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. It's it's such a joy. I I cannot tell you what a joy it is to always be with you all. You're the best looking people. Uh, You're you're just such a joy. And I've been in ministry for over 50 years. I oversee about 700 churches. I work with Pastor Joel and Lakewood Church. By the way, thank God for a great service today at Lakewood. No fear, no fear, no fear. And, uh, and really, when I come here, it just feels, I wish you knew how, what a treat it, it was for me to be standing here. And I'm really very honored to have my wife of uh, just a few weeks away from 46 years of marriage. Say something so these people can know how much I love you and why. I, I actually never know what he's going to say, so I, I get a little nervous. It's like, okay, uh, what do I do now? Um, I, I do want to say what a great joy it is to be here. I always feel a great honor when we get to be in the presence of what I would call greatness. And um, you people are really amazing. You're great. And in God's eyes, you're pretty awesome. I was thinking that uh, as we were singing, uh, you're an on-time God. And uh, it ministered so greatly to me. I, I thought about this week, I'd been reading through the book of Acts. And in the 10th chapter, Cornelius, a man that was mentioned in the word, he is down praying and he was a very devout man. He took care of the poor. He did all kind of things for his people and he prayed regularly. Well, and when he was praying, the Lord came to him and spoke to him and said, I want you to meet another individual that he has something to give to you. And so Cornelius received that. And at the same time, God was speaking to another man. He was speaking to Peter. And the Spirit, uh, the Holy Spirit had just been poured out upon the Jewish people. And Peter is uh, waiting for his lunch to be prepared. And he goes asleep and falls in a trance. And the Lord comes to him and says, I want you to meet this other man. You have something to give to him. And they end up connecting. Beautiful story. But the one thing that I took away from this that I want to share with you today is God knows exactly where you're at. He has exactly what you need. And he will send the right people to connect you with your future. Mm -mm. You, you, You don't have to make it happen. You do your part. God has called us to do a few things. Mm. You know, it's like the farmer, he sows the seed. And then while he's waiting, and we sang about waiting, he sharpens his tools. He gets ready to receive the harvest. But in all of this, it's not a works effort that we receive the blessing and the favor of the Lord. God brings us into our destiny. He connects us with people. He connects us with influence. He connects us with what we need so that we can accomplish what he has called us to do. Amen. So today, God has you where you're at. You keep doing what he's called you to do every single day. Be faithful to it. Keep your ear open to the voice of the Lord, and he will connect you with your future. I bless you today. Wow. Thank you, Jeannie. 
benediction, go home, or just get some more. Let's stand together. I'll read the word. Thank you, Jeannie. And I'm speaking to you today, but I'm speaking to your children and your children's children. I'm speaking prophetically to you today. God is going before you this week. Even now, even now, I sense, I, I feel the heart of a person over in this section. And I just want to tell you that God has already resolved the issue. He's already resolved it. And now you, you want to just say thank you, God, because he's already fixed it. I want to talk to you today about what I'm called the Joseph anointing. Now, this is a, a message I gave to your pastor. By the way, love our pastors. And uh, I have for many years. And as you know, God called me to serve them. And I've been doing that faithfully for many years. And what God is doing to this church and how God is using this church is beyond being able to be calculated. And thank you for being so strong. I said this before, the, the anointing, the vertical anointing of this church is one of the strongest in the country. Just the worship, the teaching, the preaching. I mean, if you think PT and Sarah are something, look at our bench that we have. I mean, I mean, we be very afraid whoever gets behind this pulpit, I can tell you, if you're the enemy. And uh, just, and so it was his 50th birthday in his 20th year in the, in the ministry, and God gave me Genesis 50, 20, that everything that the enemy did for harm, he would turn into harmony. And, and then in that, a prophetic word was that he would step into a Joseph anointing. And that this church would step into it, Joseph anointing. And that what touched him is now going to touch you. So I'll, I'll give that a little bit of an explanation. And then we're going to release an anointing today. But in respect to you standing, let me read our text in Ezekiel 37, verse 15. And again, the word of the Lord came to me. Now let me just real quickly set up the story. This is the story of the dry bones. Remember, dry bones dancing, the dry bones. So the prophet sees these dry bones of Israel. And they're not just dry, they're dead, twice dead. They're scattered. And he's to prophesy over them that they're going to rise up and become a great army. I want you to see your dreams. I want you to see the things in your lineage. Because I'm not just preaching to you. I'm preaching to your forefathers. And I'm preaching to your grandchildren today. And... Towards the end of that vision, then here comes the word of the Lord to the prophet. As for you, son of man, take a stick or a rod for yourself and write on it for Judah and for the children of Israel, his companions. Take another companions. Then take another stick or rod, write on it for Joseph. So play, say with me, for Judah. Say for Joseph. And... I want you to join them one to another for yourself into one stick, one rod, and they will become one in your hand. And then on to verse 26. Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace or prosperity with them, and it shall be an everlasting covenant. I will establish them and multiply them, and I will set my sanctuary in their midst forever. My tabernacle also will be with them. Indeed, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And this is the prophetic word that I'm going to release to you today. God is about to unite two tribes, two rods, two sticks, two seemingly oppositely opposed characteristics and make them one. And in that oneness, the two becoming one is going to bring a supernatural advancement of God's kingdom on the earth. Gradually, then suddenly. Lucky you that you were born for such a time as this. Count yourself privileged that you get to live in this day. 
And as you embrace in what Pastor has been teaching us about business, I, I want to give you a, better, a bigger perspective of what that means and why it's so valuable to you that as you embrace this mantle that's upon you and that you're touching, that it's going to affect everything about you and then some, and the glory of God is going to be released upon you in your life. Father, let it be so according to your word, in Jesus' name, and everybody say amen. amen, and look at somebody and say, I'm anointed, I'm anointed, and you may be seated. It's great to have our family, everybody here today, it's, it's what a great joy. Now, let me get you caught up for those of you that may not know, so, so the, the, the whole Bible, basically from Genesis 15 on, is about a, a story of a covenant that God made with Abraham. And Abraham was to be a nation of which from that nation, many nations would be born and would be blessed. Abraham had Isaac, Isaac had Jacob, Jacob had 12 sons. Those 12 sons represent the 12 tribes, and essentially, that's the way God organized the nation of Israel. And each one of these uh, tribe leaders, each one of these sons had a certain characteristic that reflected the personality and the character of God. Well, the famous one that we all, if you're a Christian and you know Christianese, the big one that we often talk about, we write about, and that is Judah. In fact, in Revelation, Jesus is called the Lion of Judah. So we sing about Judah. Judah, how many know Judah? We talk about Judah. How Judah is reflective of the anointing of worship. Whenever the battle was to be fought, they'd send forth Judah first. Judah is the tongue-talking Holy Ghost. Run the aisle, shout and scream, anointing. <laughs> that's, just, that's just, threw that out to all you Pentecostals. <laughs> Didn't sound like there's too many of you out there. I was Pentecost before it was cool, so just so you know. I was. <laughs> and, and, and Judah has been embraced, especially in, in this generation of the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit, um, all of beautiful worship that's even come from this church, the, the, the worship music that has begun to uh, impact our culture, wonderful. And I could go on and on about the anointing of Judah and how important that is. And what I'm going to assume right now, and that is that you recognize that, that we do serve the Lion of Judah, and that Judah represents the spiritual part, the anointing part, the part that we love and the part that we recognize is so needed. But then what is so interesting about why your pastor's been teaching about business and, and why this word came to him and now is trickling down and this anointing is coming to you, recognize it, respond to it, is because Joseph, what's his characteristics? Who's Joseph? And why is God putting Joseph and Judah together? I can just tell you this if you know the Bible history. They actually did not get along. In fact, Judah was a part of the whole betrayal of what happened to Joseph. So if you don't know the story, what happened is that Joseph was this guy that he was like one of his, you know, he, he, he was a favorite of his father. His father gave him a coat of, thank you, you're there. And he was a big dreamer, big talker. Oh, man, you, you don't want to have breakfast when Joseph was there. Because Joseph, oh, I dreamed last night. Really? How'd you dream? I dream that you guys all bow down to me. <laughs> yeah. And they were like, ah, oh, this punk, this guy, driving me nuts. And of course, you know, Jake, dad was like, oh, that's my son. <laughs> so there's a lot of resentment. He was called the dreamer. And you learn real easy in life that when you're five years old, everybody thinks you're cute when you talk about your dreams. But when you become a teenager and you talk about your dreams, you start getting a little pushback. And then when you get 20 and 25 and 30, and you're still talking dreams, you start becoming agitation to people. People are like, hey, get over it, all right? Dreams are for kids. And you hold on to that dream. It, 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 it irritates people. And you just stop talking about your dreams. But Joseph couldn't stop. And one day his brothers conspired against him, and, and, and they basically were going to murder him. They were going to kill him, their own brother, kill their own brother. And, and finally, you know, 
they, they compromised and said, let's just sell them. And they did. So they sold him into slavery, took his coat of many colors, got blood all over it, came back and told a lie to the dad. And Joseph starts this journey in the opposite direction of favor, a blessing, of rulership. Everything starts going the wrong direction. And he goes through a 13-year journey where, where he is lied about, he is cheated, he's betrayed. He goes through this whole journey and, uh, you know, it, Joseph, it, it wasn't good. If you Googled Joseph back in the day, you, would, you wouldn't hire him. Accused of rape. Uh, been lost several jobs. Um, went to prison. Appeared to be connected with human trafficking. I mean, you know, right? You could just really. And, and so Joseph goes through this. Well, if you know the story, ultimately, Joseph goes through all of this pain, all of this process, and everything that God, that the enemy meant for harm, God turned it into harmony. And ultimately, Joseph stepped up, and at the age of 30, became the number two man in the, at that point, the most powerful nation on the planet. In fact, the Pharaoh said, he is in charge of everything. I don't know what he was doing, but he, he went on vacation or something. <laughs> and he said, whatever Joseph says, you tell him. Whatever he says, you obey. And Joseph stepped up in the most powerful position over food, over money, over education, over all areas of in influence, Joseph stepped in there. Now, you have to remember, he's an immigrant, you have to remember, he's not of the same nationality. You gotta remember that he's been treated like a slave. You gotta remember, he's got a convict record. You, you got somebody that should not be in a position where Pharaoh said, "What you do whatever it is, because we know you got the favor of God. I've come here to prophesy to you. I've come here to fulfill a promise that your mother and your father and your grandparents were given, and they did not live to see it. I've come to prophesy to your children and your children's children. God is about to put you in a position And the Bible tells us that when Judah and Joseph were come together, and, 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 and really almost, this is where you could feel them. As I was listening to Pastor Stephanie and listening to Torre speak about this business, I know some of you are probably thinking, business? Why is he talking about business? I don't want to be business. I just want a paycheck. I just want to pay my rent. He's up here on this series about business. But I'm going to tell you something. Mind your business. I'm a, I've come here to tell you, it's time for you to take care of business. It's time for you to see you incorporated. It's time for you to see that you're not just trying to make a living. You're here to make a difference. You're not just here for you. It's not just about you. It's, it's not just about now. It's about a legacy. It's about down the road. It's about generations. It's about every step you take is one less step your children will have to take. It's about taking responsibility, about taking possession. It's about stepping up during a season that in the next five to seven years, everything is gonna shift. I was given a dream in 1998, I've said it many times. 1998, May 13, 510, God gave me a vision. The vision was so, blew my mind, it was so incredible, I wasn't even sure it could be God, it was so good. God said, the gap between heaven and, and earth is gonna close, and you're gonna be walking in one realm of the heavenlies, and in the realm of the earthly, and you're not gonna know the difference, the wall of partition's gonna be torn down, you're gonna be walking in and out of that dimension, and and that gap is going to close. Of course, I'm a Book of Revelation fan. I've been reading the Book of Revelation every day since 1998. In fact, this message is brought to you by the Book of Revelation. 
I'm trying to sell it to people because people won't read it. In Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, is all about Jesus while he was on earth. Revelation is all about Jesus now. What in the world is Jesus doing now? Well, that's the book because it's called the revelation of Jesus Christ, not the revelation of the end of the world, not the revelation of the Antichrist. The word Antichrist is not even in the book of Revelation. The word Antichrist... God said, there's a generation that's going to step into a time of favor. Now, in the next five to seven years, Christianity will come into its 50th generation. No covenant has ever lasted that long. The old covenant lasted 1,650 years. We're about to step into the 50th generation. Now, if you know anything about the Bible, it's called the Jubilee year. The Jubilee, that means in the year of Jubilee, all debts were canceled credit cards cut up and then you went to the you went to the records you went to this you know to the to the library of congress and you you started checking out all the land everything your family ever owned you get it back generations generate you get it all back now that that, that was a nice clap but that, that was a pga clap if somebody told me i'm going to have a season where i'm getting it all back It'd be a Super Bowl NFL. <laughs> uh, just, that's, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and, and we're going to step in. But the challenge is that we have to have a different mindset. You got to be prepared for God to give you and to release to you the risk and the responsibility and the rewards of seeing thy kingdom come and thy will be done. And, and, and the whole ideal of Joseph is that he was able, he managed all the wealth. He, the, the, the Bible says he had so much grain, they stopped counting it. That's like the banks coming up to you telling you, you've got so much money, we can't even calculate it. Yeah. And then he bartered that, uh, well, they didn't have any money. So then he, he bartered uh, their land. And then he became the largest landowner in Egypt. By the way, when, when God told, Jeannie gave me this a few weeks ago, when God had Egypt, when, when the Israelites left Egypt, the Bible says they were, pl- they were to plunder all their jewelry. No, they weren't plundering, they were taking back what they already had under the anointing of Joseph that they had lost 400 years earlier. So this shift, this movement, this is hovering. And your pastor and the anointing on our church is trying to tell us it's time to step up and be prepared for what God is about to do on the earth. Now, let me, let me, let me give you a scripture that will try to help you understand. Revelation 5.12 And the Bible says this, and around the throne was heard, worthy is the lamb, saying, who was slain? To receive power. Say with me, power. Power. Say wealth. Wealth. Say wisdom. Wisdom. Say strength. Strength. Say honor. Honor. Say glory. glory. Watch what he's saying. Worthy is the lamb. So then he's worthy, so come and let's bring him power. Let's bring him wealth. Let's bring him wisdom. Let's bring him strength and influence. Let's bring him honor and dignity. Let's bring him glory and praise. That's not what he gives us. That's what we give him. Now, I could just stay on this for a while, but I just want you to, just, I want you to get that. Because, you see, we, we don't really understand worship on a level that I believe that I want to release to you right now. You see, worship is about worth. Ship. When you hear the word worship, think worthship. So that when we come to God, we come with worthship. 
We have to have a sense of worthiness, that we are of worth, and that what we have and who we are is of worth. And when we come before the throne, we come with power and with influence and with strength. Uh, yeah, it's all right. I, 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 make me work for this point. I'll work it. And, and you see, the tragedy here, if I may, is by, just go with me on this journey for a moment. From the fifth chapter, then the sixth, seventh, eighth chapter of, of Revelation reveal the seven forces on the earth that make history and shape history. And then chapter 10, chapter 11. By chapter 11 and chapter 12, thank you for keeping the scripture up. By the time you get to chapter 13, the church doesn't have power nor wealth, nor wisdom, nor strength, nor honor, no glory, or no praise, because by default or by design, through deception, they've given it over to evil. (laughs) Every time you read about evil in the book of Revelation, the dragon, the beast, the whore, the serpent, The false prophet, it's quite dramatic, isn't it? All of them, the Bible says, when their names brought up, it says, for it was given to them. It was given unto the dragon. It was given unto the beast. It was given unto the false prophet. It was given unto the serpent, of which from those sources of power and influence and wealth, the system of Babylon is then built on power that was given by the dragon, by the beast, by all these crazy creatures of whom got their power from people who neglected to understand who they were, whose they were, and the kind of authority that God had given them. And either by design or default or by deception, they had given over to the enemy what was illegal and was not rightfully theirs. Okay. Well, I'll roll up my sleeve. I gotta get to work here. Yeah. Yeah. Because Jesus needs to do nothing more to give back to us what we have a right to right now. He didn't kick the devil in the shins and say, I'll make you mad and I'll come back in 2,000 years. No. He took and finished the work. See, I'm gonna go here and go here. This is gonna be hard. Some of you... You're not going to say amen to this. I know that, but I'm okay. I'm, I'm, I'm going to live with it. The Bible says when we come before God in worship, we are to cast our crowns at his feet. Hear, hear me for a second. I don't mean to hurt anybody's feeling. And if this also kind of messes with you a little theologically, just hang in there a little bit. Just give it some room to breathe. And if it's of God, it'll last. And if it's not, it'll fade away. But we have, remember one of the evil forces of the earth is false religion. So there's three systems that when they get in bed with each other, when they come into a perfect alignment, false religion, godless government, and a godless economic system. When the economy of the world and the false religion of the world and the, yeah. False religion, false government, false economic system. Godless religion, godless government, godless economic system. When they align, they become the perfect force of evil. Six, the number of man. Six, the number of man. Six. And when they come in alignment, it's like evil can take a leap into culture and bring damage so quickly. You ever played the game Red Light, Green Light? Right? They say, red light. Green light. Man, when they say green light, run as fast as you can. And when those three get in alignment, evil says, run. And next thing you know, your head's spinning. And your mic is falling off. <laughs> because evil has flipped the script. 
But today I'm here to tell you that God is saying, get your crown back. God is telling me to tell you. You see, when you hear pastor talk about prosperity and business and all that, you, you got to deal with the false religion. False religion has made prosperity into heresy. Oh, you're one of those prosperity preachers. Oh, you're one of those cross preachers. Oh, you're one of those grace preachers. They've labeled it to keep sincere and good. Why people cannot pay their rent. Why people struggle to get their kids through college. Why people are suffering. They're pounding their fist against prosperity preaching. Why we struggle. When God said, I've made you kings and priests. I've given you dominion and dignity. No, that's false religion. In fact, we have to be careful. Now, I'm going to walk real carefully on sacred ground here. But there is a false religious worship that is creeping in the church. It's a woe is me. I'm nothing. It's shame dressed up as worship. But it's not worship. It's really all about us. Oh, I'm such a sinner. I'm such a no good. Oh, God, woe is me. Oh, God, I'm so unworthy. Oh, God, forgive me. Oh, God. Oh, that's not worship. That's repentance, and don't stay there very long. Because that's not the repentance is the means to the end, not the end. My wife, Jeannie, was the worship leader at a church in Orange County. And when that song came out by Matt Redman, I'm coming back to the heart of worship. Anybody remember that? I'm coming back to the heart of worship. It's all about you. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I made it. And I tell Jeannie, just keep singing that. People are crying. People, oh, keep singing. Jeannie said, you can only say I'm sorry so many times. And then... And then what? It's like pushing the elevator button. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Oh, God, I'm sorry. Oh, God, I'm sorry. You know what? Don't mean to hurt your feelings. It's not about you. It's not about how bad you've been behaving. It's not about the fact that you've messed up and that you failed and you did things wrong. Get over yourself. Go to the altar. Accept Jesus' sacrifice. You can do no better. You can do no better. Accept it. Yeah. Yeah. One day I was going through my pattern of worship. I entered his gates with thanksgiving. I entered his courts with praise. And then, of course, there was the altar. And I went to the altar. And there's the altar of sacrifice. And I started into the woes me. Oh, God. I, I sacrifice. Oh, God. Oh, God. I'm just. And finally, God just said, uh, no, there's already somebody on there. <laughs> what do you mean? Yeah, that's my son, Jesus. He's the ultimate once and for all sacrifice. Oh, oh. Well, what, what am I to do? Go on. Go on. There's a tent right up there in front of you. The holies of holies is waiting for you. And you can't go in the holies of holies with shame when you come to the throne of God. You've got to come boldly. You've got to come bo- Unacceptable to come any other way. Boldly. Because if you're not bold, it's your smelly flesh that's keeping you from being bold. It's your filthy righteousness. Oh, man, I'm preaching this. I don't know who I'm preaching to. Don't you throw your filthy righteousness before God. Promise him you'll never sin again. You'll never do that again. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. You know what? Touch, Touch the altar. Say, thank you, Jesus. You are the once and for all sacrifice. Now, I'm not going to make this whole worship service about me. I got to get into the throne room. I got to get to the holies of holies. Who took your crown? Who took your crown? And this is what's wrong. 
I believe I'm prophesying. This is why your pastor is preaching. This is why the pastor, is because I believe God. I gave somebody a word today. I believe God is going to allow us, like the four lepers. I believe God is gonna allow us once we get our crown back and we recognize that worship is about bringing God. Here's the wealth, here's the power, here's the influence. I, I have all of this influence, God. I have all this strength. I'm the head and not the tail. I got all of this. And now, Lord, I, I'm going to lay my crown down at your feet and worth you. Worth the, you. Worth shut you. Because I am a king. I am a queen. And this king and this queen is going to bow and cast my crown at your feet. And then when you get done... Pick it back up. You walk, you walk past Paramount Studio. Hmm. That'd be mine one day. That'd be mine. My father owns that. These people are just renting it. Oh, you think I'm kidding? This is my father's world. Get your crown back on. And when you worship, get past the gate, get past the altar. Get into that holies of holies where God can empower you with a Joseph anointing. To wherever you go, there's favor. Everywhere Joseph went, favor. You're getting the lowest paying job. Give it to me. Because in three months, I'll be your boss. Yeah. 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 But you know you're a liar. You know you're a cheater. You know you're narcissistic. You know that, don't you? We're going to sell you out. That's all right. That's all right. I'll be good. You you can't have my crown. Because you didn't give it to me, you can't take it away. Oh, Jesus. That, That music means I have to close, so... Open up your heart with your hands. Stand with me right now here. Jesus. Jesus, I'm I'm speaking to you. I can hear your grandmother and your great-great-grandmother. I can hear them. They're saying, preach it, Phil. Preach it. God promised me that he would hear my prayers and that he would hear our cries. I can hear your grandkids saying, Tell them not to give up on their dreams. Tell them not to be afraid to make a risk. It's all recovery. It all can come back. You can't, it's all God's. It just, maybe it will leave your hands for a while. Because you didn't manage the business right. But that's all right, just start all over again. Because what's inside of you is worth failing for. What's inside you is worth failing for. And as long as you don't make fail yours, as long as you don't make fail yours, that's clever. As long as you don't make fail yours, then all it is is a crash course on how not to do something. Come on, talk to me. I'm trying to help you. And so right now, I just speak right now. You see, prophetically and geographically, a handful of zip codes from this place here. Just, I don't, I don't know all the zip codes, but just go, east, go north, south, east, and west. And just let's, let's grab a dozen zip codes, all right? And let's put those dozen zip codes in a circle. And I'm going to tell you, the world is under the influence of those zip codes. Money, education, entertainment. They are trickling down. To small villages in China. What goes, that's why I've always loved this church. Because I've always felt like that when I walked into this church, I was walking on territory that the enemy has had free, that he's had it and owned it. And I just keep, when I look at you, I see God saying, I've crowned you. I made you for such a time as this. I'm gonna put a pastor, I'm gonna put an apostle in your life that's gonna give you more than a song and a dance. And make you feel good and go home. And then get beat up all week by the enemy. Oh no. Babylon is falling my friend. 
Babylon is falling. Babylon is falling. I see it all. I see all the studios. I see all the music. I see all the arts. I see all of that. It's like Macy's Parade. It's all image. Are you hearing me? On the way to church today, I saw this uh, gas station or this oil change place called Val uh, something, Val, Valverine or something. And had this, uh, like a pencil man, tall, 12 feet tall. I was looking at it. I think the devil's got us so messed up, trying to make victims out of us. And we come to church every Sunday and we stomp on it. Ah, the devil is a liar! I tell you, he tried to put me down, but he's not going to put me down. I'm telling you, I've got, I got the authority. Yes, I do. And then we walk away. And by Monday morning, <laughs> and we come back to church on Sunday. Oh, the devil is a liar. Oh, but I tell you, we got the victory over him. We're going to put him down. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. And then we walk away. Are you with me? You got this image? Then follow me. Follow me. Because I saw that image at that valve, uh, valve and whatever. I looked at it. And at first I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. And then I saw a cord. I said, oh. I tell you, thank God for Pastor Tory. Because you know what he's teaching us? Don't jump on that thing. And get a good feeling alone. Go over there to the plug. What's this? This is the lie you've been feeding. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, I speak over every mountain of influence. I speak over the salt, the education. I speak over the light, all forms of entertainment. I speak over the city on a hill, economics and finances. And maybe you don't want to be a millionaire, but you can be on the team of somebody that is, and you can join ranks with a kingdom that needs to advance and going to advance and be a part of this world's solution. You are anointed. Somebody whisper, I'm anointed. I'm anointed. Somebody say, I'm anointed. Somebody say, I'm anointed. Everybody get your hands on your, your crown here and straighten it out a little bit, straighten it out a little bit. Say, I'm anointed. Say, I have dominion. I have dignity. I have a destiny. Look at me. Look at me. I feel the Holy Spirit of God. I feel the Holy Spirit of God. I got. I got to tell you this story. My, my daughter, my daughter has worked for our ministry since she was 18. She went to Bible school for a year. She worked for our ministry either part time, or full time, for 25 years, and. Two things I want to say. First of all, I'll never forget the story she told. One time we sent her to an evangelist who was at our church and we put him in residence in. And she went to take food over to them and the husband was gone. She knocked on the door. The wife said, come in. She walked in. Literally, the mother, hair all over the place. A, a, one boy on one hip and another boy on the other hip, literally. And two other boys running up and down the steps. And Kara said, here's some food uh, the church wants to provide. She said, thank you. And Kara took that food, laid it down, and walked out backwards, closed the door, and said to herself, I never want to be that woman. I got dreams. I got goals. I got plans. And then life happened. 
and she found herself asleep in the bathtub. And she woke herself up realizing that she had slept. She was so tired because she had three kids that had been pulling on her all day. And the thought came to her, I am that mom. And then God said, oh, yeah. Do you remember who that woman was? She thought for a second, ah, that was Lisa Bevere. If you don't say, wow, then you don't know who Lisa Bevere is. But Lisa Bevere became one of the most incredible national, international speakers, best-selling author. That was just a season. That was just a season. I'm telling you, do not give up on your dreams. I'm telling you, God is looking for people that will step up, put their crown on, and get the Joseph anointing on them and say, we are here. We are here. And so, Father, and I'll just say this. I feel led to say this. So, a a year or so ago, Kara needed another job. She needed a job. We were just paying her full part-time. With no college education, right? Never worked for anybody but a church. She applies for executive assistant to a $250 million startup corporation based on the fact that she has to and can only work from her home. She gets the job. Six figures from her house. Making a difference while she's yelling at, I mean, why she's just, why she's loving on her kids. Say it's possible. Somebody shout it's possible. I am a child of God. So Father, let every, let every woman, let every single mother, let every man who has lost their dignity and sense of purpose, let these young people that have been told by society that they'll never have as much as their parents had. I speak to every heart that's here and watching online, the Joseph anointing is upon you. And if you don't know it, just hold on to the hem of the garments of your pastors. Just grab a hold of the hem of the garments of the anointing that's upon their life and don't let go because it's going to put you before mighty men and put you before great opportunities. It's going to open up doors for you. And the least of you shall become the greatest. And those who have suffered, ridiculed, God is a God of vindication. Do not look to man. They will disappoint you every time. Do not look to systems of the world. They cannot handle the blessing you deserve. And then I'm going to pray a prayer, but I want to do this. Watch me. I want to just make this real clear in my last few moments. See, Babylon is a, is a corrupt system that's been fed by the dragon, the beast, the false prophet, the serpent, of which their power came from us because we lost our worth. We didn't even know we had this. We, we didn't even know what we were doing here. We thought we were an accident. And we, we just, and, 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 and so, but God is waking up people. He's releasing this Joseph anointing. He's doing something. And, and, and Babylon, the Bible says, will fall in an hour. It'll go so quick. So, we've already seen a few trickle hints of some of the greatest producers are in jail today because evil is being held accountable. We're going to see corporations that seem untouchable with their greed. And they're going to be in prison this time next year. Babylon is going to fall. It's already tipping. The rumbling has already begun. But hear me. If we're not ready to step up, it'll rebuild itself. 
I got to hear, you got to hear the God inside me. I, I know there's a better way of saying it, but I'm just me. It's all I know to do is what I'm up here screaming and ranting and raving because I'm trying to tell you, get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready. God's about to judge Babylon and when he does, you step up and you walk in, you walk in, you walk in. But here's the key. You're in Babylon, but you're not in, you're not of Babylon. And here's the key. Because we love Jeremiah 29. We love Je- uh, Jeremiah 29, 11. The, quote it for me. The plans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got the general idea. But we don't know the context. Let me give you the context. Put this plaque on your wall. Because for 70, for 70 years, you're going to be in captivity. And you'll never see freedom. Your great grandkids will. But you remember, I'm going to make good out of this. And though Babylon's going to have you for 70 years, you just know this. The plans I have for you, they didn't look good. It don't look like it's fair. It don't look like that women have been treated right. It doesn't look like that minorities have been treated. It doesn't look like certain people aren't in the 1%. But it don't matter. God said, I have plans for you and not good and they're not for evil. And you hold on to that. Because when Babylon falls, you'll be the first to step. Now, here's the key. You're in it, but you're not of it. I don't know a lot about football, but I know this. I know that when the quarterback gets the ball and the receivers, somebody say, I'm a receiver. Yeah, yeah, I'm a receiver. When the receivers, they go, they got it. They're being defended, and they're really good. They got two or three people around them. They're like, leave me alone, man. Come on, man, I'm trying to, I need a break, man. Come on, I need a break. And then God just gives you an instinct, and at the last second, you make separation. And that's what the quarterback's looking for. I know you're there, I know you're out there, but I need some separation. I need some people that are in the music industry that are in there, but I need to know that if I'm ready to give you a miracle, you can make some separation. I may be in it, but I'm not of it. I'm not of it. Create. Create separation. Come out from among them. Give God a chance. Come on, give God praise, everybody. Give God praise. My God. All right. Holy Spirit, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for these wonderful people watching online. Thank you for these wonderful people that are here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Holy Spirit, fill in the blanks. Fill in the blanks. Finish this off for me, God. Drop the word, drop the revelation, drop the confirmation, drop the witness. Do it. Hey, ah, oh, Holy Spirit, mm, fall. Oh, let the light shine. Let my heart burn again. Let the dreams come alive again, again. Dry bones. Come alive. Shame, you die. You got a prayer language, it's a good time to do it right now. Hey, those watching and those here present if you were to lose your life in the next few minutes and face almighty God are you at peace with God if not 
I want to give you an opportunity to make peace with God. Here's the good news. God's not mad at you. He has already forgiven you of all your sins. All you need to do is to accept the free gift of eternal life. And that only comes through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Or perhaps you are a Christian, but you've grown cold in your heart towards God. You've walked away. You've become critical and cynical and cold. Ah, uh, but you say, I want a fresh start. I, I want a new beginning. If that's you, I'm going to give you an opportunity to send a signal to heaven that you're ready to be born again. You're ready for a new, fresh start with Christ. If that's you, with no shame, I want you to boldly throw up your hands and say, I want Christ to be Lord of my life. I want to make peace with Almighty God through Jesus. I want a fresh new start. Raise your hand. Don't be afraid. Don't be ashamed. Raise your hand. All over the building. All over the building. You're not going to walk out of here the same. You're not going back to that life. In Jesus' name. Father, thank you for those that... And keep your hands up. It's good for you. You're, you're, you're going to get boldness while your hands up. You're going, you're going to get resolve. There's an anointing come on you while your hands are up. Lord God, in the name of Jesus, come now upon them. For no man cometh to you but by the Spirit. And that was you that prompted their hands to go up. Their heart was pounding. That was you saying, this is the day that you have a fresh new beginning. And beloved, let's pray together with them. Everyone say these words with me. Lord Jesus... I believe in you. I believe you are the Son of God. You died on the cross for my sins. I repent of my sins. I make you Lord of my life. And from this day forward, I surrender, not to my works, not to my righteousness, not even to my efforts, but I surrender to the work you have done for me and by having faith in righteousness through you the power the power to become is even now being released <laughs> Woo, give god praise everybody come on the heavens are the heaven and the earth is closed hey come on everybody give god some praise there's an anointing here there's an anointing here Come on, get your crown and give God some praise, some power, some strength. Hey! Woo! I love you so much. I hope this means as much to you as it does to me. But I'm going to finish this message next Sunday. I'll be back. I love you all.